All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the BC Lions Coaches Playbook series presented by Boza Construction and GML Mechanical. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be your host for this evening. Tonight, we have a bonus webinar for everyone as part of Grey Cup Unite. Uh, if you're back with us and you've seen our past Coaches Playbook series uh, throughout the month of October, we want to thank you for coming back. And if this is your first one, uh, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. So the way it's going to go, if you are new, uh, we're going to hear from our special guest for the next 45 minutes or so and reserve the last five or 10 minutes for any questions that anyone in watching may have. Uh, you're able to use the chat, or sorry, the Q&A function to uh, have any, or sorry, to ask any questions throughout the presentation and we'll try to get to as many as we can, there's no guarantee, but we'll try and answer as many questions uh, as we can. With that said, I'm gonna introduce our guest uh, and with it, you know, being what would have been Grey Cup week and, uh, you know, in, in, uh, with uh, Grey Cup Unite going on, we want to bring someone on who knows a thing or two about winning a Grey Cup and uh, he's won three of them over the course, course of his career. Uh, and that is BC Lions head coach, Rick Campbell. Rick, how are you doing tonight? Pretty good. How are you doing? Good. All right. Are we ready to go? You're good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out tonight. Um, this would have been Grey Cup week. So um, while it's sad it's not happening, I'm excited to be here to talk some football tonight. Um, I wanted to start out just by sharing a little bit about me so you can get to know me a little bit and about my football journey. Um, so I'm originally from Spokane, Washington. Um, some of you might have known my, my dad was involved in football too, mostly in the CFL, some in the NFL. I, I bounced around a little bit growing up um, and I ended up <clears throat> graduating high school in Edmonton. Um, I went to Washington State uh, to school, and um, uh, a little bit about me, let me think about what would be some interesting things to say would be, um, I'm a, I went to college in the 90s, so I'm a pretty big Pearl Jam fan, tragically hip, those type of things. Um, Vancouver's fit in well for me, um, being originally from Spokane and spending a lot of time in uh, Washington and Idaho and in BC, I, I really like getting out and hiking and, and, and being outside. I'm looking forward to possibly skiing some this weekend and do that. Um, I was able to do the grouse grind a couple times uh, this summer, which I about passed out both times I did it, but uh, that's all good. Um, football wise, I... Actually, when I got out of college, I was a high school teacher and I was a baseball and high school football coach for two years in Spokane. So I got the, the high school experience. I thought that was something I might end up doing. I really enjoyed teaching. I liked the school atmosphere. Uh, I had an opportunity to go to the University of Oregon, which was an up and coming program. And it was really a good decision. I was able to be there for three years, work with a lot of, a real, of really good coaches that became head coaches in college football that were really good mentors for me. So I got that, um, that high school experience for, for a couple of years, the college experience for three years. And then I've been in the CFL ever since uh, 1999, which is amazing to me that I've gotten this old this fast. But I've, uh, so I've coached every single year in the CFL in some capacity since 1999. So this was really, this whole, this year was quite different. This is the first, uh, you know, summer and fall I haven't spent coaching football in whatever that is, 20, 20 something years. So quite different. I have in the CFL, I've uh, done everything from being a position coach to being a special teams coordinator um, a defensive coordinator. I also spent um, time working with the offense in Calgary. I wanted to try to get as, uh, as much well-rounded experience as I could. And then I was able to get my first head coaching job. Um, I was the head coach in Ottawa for six years. And then I'm um, excited to be here in Vancouver and uh, 
and to keep going. So um, looking forward to getting the Lions back out on the field coming, uh, coming uh, hopefully sometime this spring. So we'll see how that all goes. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight, the, the topic of tonight was building a successful program or successful team. So I know that you've heard from our position coaches and I think this talk, and I hope I can leave it open-ended at the end where you can ask some questions. To me, this would apply whether you are the head coach and in charge of a whole football team at whatever level it is, um, or if you're a coordinator, a defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, special teams, or your position coach. I think all of this applies because I think everybody's a leader on the football team. And when you're in charge of a group of men, whether that's a whole team or a position group or whatever that is, um, you can have a pretty profound effect um, on people. And this game really is a people business, just like most things are in life, but it's really about um, the people that you're dealing with. So there's the scheme part of it and, and the teaching of uh, the scheme and the strategy and all that, which is all the part um, we love. I love it, it's extremely important. Um, but I can make a pretty good argument that's even more important is that if you can get uh, a group of players that are engaged and understanding what they're doing, um, that's where the kind of the special stuff happens. The stuff you can't, when you talk about a special football team, I think we all always remember sports teams that, that have that certain it factor um, where they, they kind of tough things out. They're able to win close games. They compete really hard, all those things. So there's the talent part of it, which is very important, but there's the other part of it, like I said, which is the stuff you can't always put your finger on, but you know what a good team looks like. And I think that they have some of these characteristics. So I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Still learning Zoom. So Tyler, you can let me know if there's anything I'm doing wrong here. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so here's my thoughts on building a successful team. So the first part is leadership. And this comes from being a coach, whatever you are. And these are the characteristics of people that have influenced me over my life and that I've found that have been effective to me. So one is being authentic. And part of that, something that I always remembered with me is that substance endures and style is fleeting. I know we all love a pregame speech, especially in a movie, those type of things. And while they do have their place, um, that's, not, that's not where it is. It's the substance of you showing up every day and being yourself and, and doing those things. So um, uh, it's good for a movie, but uh, the, it's the day in and day out of you showing up every day and, uh, and, and being yourself and being a real person um, that that uh, that people are going to appreciate and and want to follow, and part of that on the number point number two is sharing yourself, um, and communicating your thoughts and feelings. So I I have to say this the right way. I'm not saying this has to be the Oprah Winfrey show, but you got to let people in to see who you are a bit, and 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 share the ups and downs when you're competing in sports a lot of tough stuff happens. There's highs and lows of the joy of winning and anger and sadness and all those things. And I think you got to let, let that all show and let, let them know that you're a real person that, um, and, and that's where kids and even adults playing pro football, they'll learn a lot from that. And they'll buy into the fact that, um, you're not trying to hide things from them. You're trying to be open and, and share yourself. So, um, that's always something I've appreciated. The other one is being engaged. And I, I just always go back. I, I try to remember when I'm the head coach, I go back to when I was my, whatever, my first year of, of playing football or playing in high school or when I was first started out coaching, just having leaders and this example, a head coach um, that's engaged and um I think it's that you can do some good work that doesn't directly have to do with football. I put on here is don't underestimate the influence you can have 
have by asking someone how their day is going. But if you ask someone how their day is going or how life is going or things like that, and these don't have to be long conversations, but if you can build some rapport with people that's outside of talking about football, it's going to make the football part a lot better. So the more you can be engaged, and I think the more you can be engaged in a natural way, just in the, the daily flow of uh, what's going on is whether that's spending time in a locker room or spending extra time with a kid before practice or after practice or things like that. And that's just part of, um, you know, these are things that are part about being a good parent or being a good teacher or being a good coach, all those things. So I think all that is extremely important. The other one is leading by example. And I think we would all be more willing to someone that walks the walk as opposed to talks the talk. So if you're gonna, I never wanna ask people to do things that I wouldn't do. So um, I think the best way you can preach work ethic and um, doing all the hard work, all those things is to do that by example, instead of just telling someone how to do it is uh, people are gonna follow the, the lead they get uh, from their leaders. All right, another subject is empowering people and promoting engagement. So this is something I got better at in my six years in Ottawa as we, as we kind of came along and got more comfortable. And they seemed like simple things at the time, but I realized looking back that they're real important. So one is, and I'm talking about the players and the coaches on the team, is letting people be themselves and let them share their story is, they need to fit into the team, but they also need, they're, they're gonna come and bring their best effort the more you allow them uh, to be themselves. When I say let them share their story, one, it's something that happens on a daily basis, but two, for a, another example of a concrete example is I would get guys up by position group in meetings or even on the field after practice and uh, we'd go through an exercise of having guys stand up and talk about um, you know, where they're from, what their interests are, um, those type of things. And I, I always thought, man, this seems so simple, but as that exercise goes on and you have people share their stories, man, it becomes powerful because people feel more comfortable in the environment and they really start uh, opening themselves up. And when you do that, that's where you start getting that uh, teammate uh, camaraderie and all that stuff that you need. So um, I wanted to people to feel like it was a safe space where they could bring the, their individual selves to work while still fitting in with, uh, with the team goals. Another huge one, number two, um, is getting players to discover their why. And what I mean by that is this is another exercise where this can come in where people could share it in a position group, they could share it in front of the whole team. But if you can get to get people to discover on why they're doing what they're doing from, if it's a high school football player, why are you playing? What do you hope to get out of it? What is the purpose by what you're doing? And sometimes it takes people some time to think about that. Sometimes it takes me time to think about things I'm doing in life on, on, on what's my why, because that's the ultimate motivation is if you know, if you, if you can answer that on, on why something's important to you, and there's not always one right answer, and you're not looking for a specific answer, but if a, if a kid can figure out their why of, of why they're doing this and what they hope to get out of it, I think you're cooking with gas there because then that, that guy starts becoming self-motivated um, and not just uh, doing something because a coach yelled at him and told him to do it. He's just going to become more invested in the whole thing. Um, number three is understanding if a player understands how their role impacts the success of the team, it just furthers their reason to want to do well. And um, again, not everybody can describe that. You can't assume that everybody knows that, but if once a guy understands what their role is, no matter how small it is, he's going to want to do it well, and he's not going to want to let his teammate down. And again, if you can get a guy in that spot, then that's huge. That could be a guy from protecting a field goal to covering a kickoff 
um, to doing things, maybe not the fun stuff of scoring touchdowns and all that, but that all those things that are going to impact um, a, a close football game. And when and when players understand what they're doing and how it what they do, it's going to make them feel important that man, what I what I'm doing is having an effect on whether my teammates and me have success. And and when that can be defined and they un, and they understand that then um, good things are happening. I always try to remember to be a good listener and give people the space to be seen and heard. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna implement or listen to everything a guy might say, but you would be surprised how much you can learn from players. And um, just that they have that space where they feel they can con contribute in an idea or something, that's great. It doesn't mean that you're going to listen to 50 different people and be all over the map, but it just means that uh, um, you're not telling a guy to shut up. You're telling a guy that he can have a space where he uh, he can talk to you. So that's a good thing. Number five is huge. Any good football team that I've been on not only had talented guys, but everyone on the team was a leader. And there's a, a ton of different ways to be a leader. That's not just the guy standing in the locker room trying to get fire, guys fired up. It's how guys lead by example, how they practice, how they prepare. All those things are huge. And when, and when people are bought into being a leader and understanding their role on the team, again, that's when, that's when good things happen. All these things don't happen automatically. I think it's got to be fostered in an environment and you there's going to be a small group of guys that just do it automatically. There's going to be another group of guys on the other side that don't want any part of it or don't know how to be a part of it. And then there's going to be people in the middle that are going to follow the leaders and you want to get the people in the middle to to go to the guys that are are the natural leaders and um, creating momentum in that direction. All right, command of the subject matter. This was a big one for me growing up as a coach. And I still remember, I still remember stuff. I, I remember this to this day because I don't know everything. So my point number one on this is the number one thing a player wants from a coach or a teacher is to trust that they can make them better. So one of the first things I learned at Oregon when I was a young coach that was nervous and, and, you know, I just trying to find my way is the head coach told me is that I don't know is an acceptable answer. And I always remember that because he goes, you have to have the trust of the players. So you never want to give them false information or BS them because people are going to see through that and you're going to lose your credibility. So I even tell our coaches to this day, if we don't have a good answer for someone on whatever the topic is, a, a scheme or how to do something or whatever is, we'll tell them we don't know, but we're gonna go find the answer and we'll get back to you. So um, I, I guess it's not about being a Mr. Know-it-all, it's about being a guy that uh, is willing to be honest and to give people good information. But you, you ask, a any football player from a young kid to a, a CFL football player, pro football player, the biggest thing they want from a coach is to know that, man, this guy, I trust this guy. He's, he's helping me and steering me in the right direction. Number two is it's a skill to know how to place people in roles they can succeed in. So every team is a dynamic structure. You're dealing with a football team, Football I love because you're dealing with so many people, so many moving parts. And at times it's hard to solve that chemistry issue of who fits where and who you're gonna ask to do what. But you wanna get people to do something that they have a chance of succeeding in. It doesn't mean that they're never gonna fail, but it means you're not, you're not, asking, you're not asking a guy to do something that he has no chance to do. So as you figure that out and figure out the pieces of the pieces of the puzzle of what position to put guys in, what kind of scheme to run, it's the the whole thing is that if, if you're trying to fit the players into your scheme, 
I, I just don't think it's going to work. The idea is that you need to fit what you're doing into what the players you have. So you, you don't play the cards you wish you had. You play the cards that are in your hand to the best of your ability. So, and sometimes it's going to be great. You're going to have a bunch of studs that make you look good. Other times you're going to do your best coaching when you really got to find ways, strategize to get guys in good position. So um, I always remember that. Um, number three is to be clear on what you're asking your players to do. This is something for me, I need to remember. I'm, I, I can get to be a big picture guy. I remember being a defensive coordinator and I think of concepts and schemes, but I think the really good coaches and especially as you get down to the position coaches is really be clear on, on what you're asking a guy to do and how he can do it so that, that, he's, that he's got a good chance and don't ever assume that people understand it. We even, we deal with that in the CFL level, pro football players is, is we gotta be really specific on, uh, on giving them a, a chance to succeed by telling them exactly what we what we're trying to do and, and how to do it. Number four is another one for me personally, depends on who you are, but I always got to remember to be really good at what we do. So this is the less is more theory. Um, sometimes the biggest mistake coaches make at any level, including NFL, CFL, is proving they're the smartest guy in the room and they got a million ideas and we're going to trick people and do all those things. That's fun, but you, you need to be really good at what you do. And sometimes you can be so good at things that even if the other team knows what you're doing, you can still execute it anyway. So err on the side of less is more and only keep advancing as you, as you get good at what you're doing. All right, communication and feedback. So number one is being specific with your feedback and give it often. So um, when I, in practice, um, when I say be specific is tell a guy how to do something. Don't just say, well, try harder or run faster or whatever is talk about hand placement or steps or th specific things that are going to help the guy to be better. And when I say it, do, do it more often, if you do it in small doses, it's not overwhelming. If you try to give a dissertation to someone, you know, one big dissertation on something, it, it can get lost or confusing. So if you can make small tweaks and be a good observer during practice or a game on, on those little things guys can do better, they're going to digest it better and understand it better. And um, like I said, being the, the more specific you are, the better the chance they have of understanding it. Big believer in number two about being process oriented rather than results oriented. So I'll give you the example in pro football, our number one job is to win, period. That's what, that's what we're here for, is to, is to win football games. But we talk about winning at the very beginning and everybody wants to win. That's not the issue is that you can ask anybody, any, any kid or high school player, or college player, pro player, everybody wants to win because it's fun, but that's not where we got to motivate people. We got to motivate them and the process of getting good so that you have a chance to win. So um, I'm all, I gave an example here of setting small specific goals to accomplish every day. So, um, and I do it personally is I'll write down, if I'm wearing training camp, I'll write down three specific things um, that, that I want to get better at. Um, could be a receiver, could be, I want to run that out route better. I know I need to run it at 12 yards. Whenever that's called today, I'm going to make sure I run it correctly. Things like that to have goals of being like, well, I'm just going to practice hard or um, I'm going to run hard. It's not specific enough. If you get those specific goals and I set it at three, cause I don't want to have too many, but if I have three every day and I keep checking those off the list, um, we call it knocking down the dominoes, but it's the, it's the domino effect. If you can knock down the first domino and get that chain reaction going, 
as an individual, things take off for you. And man, as a football team, if you can ever get a bunch of guys knocking down the dominoes each day of doing those little specific things. And I, I would give it to guys as a homework assignment, but I would make it engaging too, to a fact we would do it in either a position group or maybe as the defense, but you can, you can tell guys to, you know, go home, write your three things you're going to get better at today. And then, and then come back tomorrow. And the way we would check in with it again, to make it a little more fun and interesting is, is to get a guy up in the room and say, tell us what your three things you wrote down last night about what you're going to do better at practice today. And it just, it keeps people accountable, makes it interesting, keeps people engaged, those type of things. But they're kind of a, a few little tricks, I would say, to, to keep guys on task and do that. And it, and it becomes fun for them because they, they honestly sit down and do some critical, critical thinking about uh, at, at what they're going to do better. So that's kind of a fun process to see what happens. And it's and it really in training camp, you can tell if you're going to be a good team or not by, like I said, if you can knock, if you can start knocking down those initial dominoes and get that momentum going, then uh, man, you can get better each day. Number three is I think you can do these things I'm talking about and it, it makes you aware and observant, but it doesn't make you a micromanager. I, I'm not sure if I know of anyone that likes a micromanager that's going around telling everybody what to do all the time. So um, there's a way to be aware and know what's going on with the football team without being in everyone's business all the time. And I think you can do your best coaching and most specific coaching if you're having issues with guys one-on-one -on -one. so there'll be times you obviously you'll be coaching on the field I'm not saying that but the bigger the issue the more impact you're going to have if you can do that one-on-one -on -one in a conversation in your office or after practice or things like that and I think that's a that's a a way of letting people know that I got my eyes on you and I know what's going on, but you're not, uh, you're not in their business every second of the day. So this last slide is, this is at any level of football and I think it applies to any sport is it's gotta be fun too. So as coaches and players and competitors, we tend to err on the side of intensity and drama and passion and all those things which are totally necessary. I'm not saying they're not, but there has to be a balance of making the environment fun too. So the notes I have here, the fun and challenging thing about football is you're dealing with a large diverse group of people. Football's a tough game that requires physical, mental and emotional courage. Um, the part about not wearing anxiety of a badge of honor there's some people that go around um, yelling and criticizing and doing things that they think they care more and they actually don't and they do more damage than they do good. So there's a place for intensity. Um, there's a place for being hard on guys. But if, if you choose your spots, they're going to listen to it more. If you're just a guy that goes around ranting and raving all the time, you're going to get tuned out. So that's the part of uh, not overstressing people. That the stress is going to come because when you're competing, especially in a physical sport like football, and a guy's trying to knock your head off, there, there's a natural intensity there. So you need to try to um, find that balance. I always remember too is nobody wants to go out and purposely fail. I don't, there's guys that screw up and, and do that type of stuff, but I don't know many people that want to go out in public or fans in the stands or their teammates or all that and purposely want to fail and lose. So I always remember that as people want to do well, sometimes they need a lot of guidance to get to that point, but they, if they're, if, if, if they know why they want to play football then they're going to want to succeed. And that's where the coaching comes in, where you can help them on that path to do it. And I'm a big believer in embracing and empowering people that have the courage to put themselves in the arena. 
So there's some people that are critics or that don't want to engage in competition or sport, but the, the people, and that can be from kids to pro football, that are willing to go out there and do some hard things and participate in something where they don't know if they're going to succeed on, on the scoreboard. You don't, winning is never guaranteed, but that you're, you're willing to go out there and compete and try as you should in, embrace and know brace and empower those people. And that's my, that's my number one favorite thing about football players and football coaches is you're doing something that not, you're not required to do. You're doing something because for the love of competition and, uh, and to go out there and do your thing. So um, that's my formal presentation and the stuff I wanted to share with you tonight. And I wanted to give time to for people to open up and have some dialogue and, and talk some football. So um, Tyler, how am I doing on the screen sharing and all that? Am I all right? That's, you're good. You're out. Yeah, we're back to where we began. So I think it should be noted that I did that by myself. So I did. <laughs> Very good. I want, I want that credit. <laughs> so I got, um, I got three questions here that have been submitted so far. And for anyone else there out in the call, uh, now is the time. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. So let me start off here. I got a couple from John in North Vancouver. So his first question is when he was growing up playing sports, he was constantly told the mantra, no pain, no gain. He wants to know, is that something that you subscribe to? Do you believe in no pain, no gain? Well, I guess I would take that phrase is that um, it's going to take a lot of hard work. <laughs> I don't view that as no of strict physical pain, but you're going to, if you want to, uh, anything that you do that's a big accomplishment in life, there's going to be some hardships to it. There's going to be some pitfalls and some, some things where it's not always a success. So to, to, um, what's the saying? You don't, you don't reach the mountaintop from the mountaintop. You got to climb your way up as you go. So I think that's the way I would take that phrase is that um, when you're trying to accomplish some, some type of worthwhile goal, you're going to have to put in some, some hard work and all that. So that's how I would, uh, that's how I would take that phrase. Yeah, I would too. Here's another question. Um, it has to do with specialists. So punters, uh, field goal kickers, placeholders. How much he wants to know how much attention is devoted to in practice for coming up with um, design trick plays or broken plays? Like, is that a focus of a championship team? Yeah. So number one, special teams. Um, we treat that just as in, as important as offense or defense, especially in Canadian football. There's a lot of special teams plays. Um, as far as trick plays or fake plays, I, I practice stuff that I actually might use in the game. <laughs> that part of the credibility thing is if you have some, if you have a field goal fakes or punt fakes that you practice every week and you just never use them, after a while, the players kind of roll their eyes like, what are, what are we doing here? So it doesn't mean you have to run every trick play that you practice, but I try to remember to to try to be good at special plays and design them for a reason. And, and I try to describe to the players ahead of time too of when we might use it in a game so that when we actually use it, they're not surprised. They're not making the call, but they're not surprised about, you know, if we get in this situation in third and four um, in their end of the field, you know, don't be surprised if we run the steel goal fake and, and those type of things. So keeps the keeps them more invested in it. One other thing I'll say about special teams, <clears throat> as far as special skills like kickers, punters, um, long snappers, is there's no shame or harm in going out to get if if you have the resource or know someone that actually is a specialist in doing that. I'll give you an example. There's not one coach on our football team and we're a pro football team that is a full-time kicking coach. Now these guys go see people and we have them go see, um, see specialists, but I'm not, 
again, that goes back to, I'm not going to tell a pro football kicker how to, to be a kicker when I'm not one myself. So, um, especially with the specialists, if you can, if, if the, if you have the resources or, um, the ability to get them hooked up with people. And there are people out there that uh, can do that. Great. And then I have another question that is kind of related to the last question we just had. It's from Evan. Um, he said he is, he's an Ottawa Red Blacks fan. He's been a fan since day one back in 2014. And he said he always enjoyed looking forward to the one trick play that you would seeming, seemingly implement for each game. Um, his question is what is your philosophy around the advantage of the Canadian football's distinctive rules? Well, special teams is the number one thing that makes it more fun. So not to knock the NFL, but the NFL's in the mode of taking special teams out of the game. So if you watch an NFL game this weekend is most of the kickoffs are just gonna go out of the back of the end zone. There's very few returns a lot of fair catches, all that stuff. So they've chose to dial down special teams. We've done the opposite in the CFL where it's a, a huge part of the game. And um, I think it totally makes it more fun. Um, I, I, and I think most people think that if you, if you were just to ask football people that have been around football for a long time, the, um, the CFL game is much more interesting. And if, when you ask the guys, I know several guys that have coached special teams in the NFL or U.S. college or in the CFL. And man, being a special teams coach in the CFL keeps you on your toes just because there's uh, so much more things that can happen. And, and I think it's a good thing. And I, I hope we keep all those rules around. Yeah, I agree. There's definitely a different element um, on special teams in Canadian football. Um, we don't have any other questions um, for us. Oh, we might just have two. Is Rick related to Hugh Campbell? I think he is, but maybe you, you want to. I am. <laughs> or Hugh's related to me. No. <laughs> yes. No, I am. That's my dad. That's his dad. There you go. And then from Monty, do you have a plan on having a strong running game or a heavy passing team next season? And what is your goal? Sorry, or is the goal to have strong options in both avenues? Well, that would be our number one goal is to have strong options in both avenues. But going back to my statement about fitting the fitting what we do to the players as we form our roster and get that all together, is, is we're going to emphasize what we're really good at and what we do best. So um, the CFL definitely with three downs is you got to be able to throw the ball and throw it well. But um, um, we're definitely going to make an emphasis on the on the run game too. Great. Um, I do have a, another question, and this this might not be something that you might believe in, but how much? This is from Craig. How much of a team's great chemistry can be chalked up to unexplainable magic? So, do you believe in uh, teams that get lucky at the end, or is that is that part of the preparation? Luck is involved, but if I, I'm if if he's saying what I'm thinking, I'm talking the the that when you call it either magic or special. I think you, I think we all know teams. We've either been on teams or you know of teams that kind of have that special sauce of there's just an it factor to the team where they got that good energy. Um, that good vibe to them where they um, like whatever the saying is when the going gets tough, the tough get going is they kind of rise up in those special moments. And that's the, as in pro sports, that's really the key these days because the talent level is really similar. So you're really looking to foster that environment where um, these things I'm talking about, where you get guys that are really engaged and that are really good teammates um, that, well, football is the ultimate team sport because you're dealing with 50 guys on a team. So the best players don't win, the best teams do, which is a pretty cool concept. So you obviously have to have good individual players, but the best football teams win, not the, not the, best, uh, not the best players. So that's the fun part about it for me. 
And that's something I've just tried to cultivate over the years and get better at is trying to foster that um, foster that magic or that that stuff you can't always quite put a finger on. Um, that's where the that's where the good stuff happens. Great. And I do have one more question here before we wrap up. Um, and this would be having to do with if you were coaching high school and if you were starting a new team, how would you evaluate a new team of teenagers or football players before, um, you know, putting them out and assigning them to uh, different positions on the field? What would, what would your uh, first couple steps would be there? If you're, if you're starting new, I've been a part of that. That's what I did in Ottawa. So that's, that's where it, it's fun, but it's challenging, but you want to get guys, like I said, you got to think about what you're trying to do and um, see how guys run and, and catch and do all those things. And then you're, you're going to really have to experiment and learn as you go, but you want to, um, you got to start placing guys in positions based on their body types and what their skill set is physically. And then, um, kind of adapt as you go, but especially if you're starting new with a new team, um, you're gonna really have to be someone that can evolve and adapt to the situation of, of learning who the players are and what they can do and go from there. But that that sounds exciting to me if, if, it's, a, if it's a new team. Definitely wish you the best. That'll be, it'll, it's, it'll be interesting and it'll be fun too, I know that. Great, yeah. And uh, one last question, I lied, we got one more. Um, would Rick have a word or two about the similarities and differences between his dad's and his own style of coaching? I didn't. I was so young that I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time around him as a coach. Um, but the number one thing I learned as I grew up and what um, I learned from him is that it's, it, is, it comes down to how you treat the people and how engaged they are in the team, how much they feel a part of it. That's a common theme with everything. Like I said, it, to me, there's two parts of it. It's the talent level, which is obviously critically important. The guys have to be good enough to do it. But the other part is, is how you treat a group of people. And it's not only a football team. It could be people working at a restaurant or whatever you're doing with a group of people. I think we've all known the situation where we feel engaged and proud and want to do well for the cause. And um, that's, uh, that's not an accident when that happens. So you, you surround yourself with as good a people as you can find and you treat them the best you can. And then uh, that's where the fun stuff happens. Great. And sorry, we have one more question. I keep saying we got one right. more. Um, this person wants to know, I don't have a name, just as an anonymous attendee, who are some of the best coach, sorry, the best players you've ever coached at any level or a couple, a few names. God, I hope I hate singling people out. Um, I, the, my most recent example is I got to work with Henry Burris and, um, in Ottawa as a quarterback. And the quarterbacks can have such a big influence on a, on a football team just because of the position they're in with the ball in their hands every time, um, uh, but can be really good leaders and have a huge impact. And I, that's how Mike Riley is here in BC. I haven't got to work with him yet, but I know what type of guy he is. So I always appreciate uh, the good quarterbacks. God, that's a great question. There's so many, there's so many guys over the years that have been um such good players and I think the the guys that I always appreciated the most were the guys that could really persevere and re were resilient I mean I always have respect for the talented guys but the those guys that could always find a way to get it done um those are the those are the guys I remember so I know I'm not giving you too many specific answers but I I gotta I gotta think about that one but Lots of, lots of good players over the years. Been lucky. That's great. Well, with that said, uh, we're going to wrap up tonight's Coaches Playbook Seminar, BC Science Coaches Playbook Seminar with Head Coach Rick Campbell. So again, thanks to Boza Construction and GML Mechanical for making this program happen. Without their support, we, this would not be possible. 
Well, I everyone know that on Saturday, 4.30 Pacific, at, in on Facebook, the BC Lions Virtual Den page will be hosting a 2000 Grey Cup reunion. So I'm going to Montreal in 2000. It'll be a pre-record of a few players that are on the team, and they'll share some memories. And Matt Baker will be the host. So we hope that everyone can join and tune in to that at 4.30 p.m. Pacific this Saturday. Once again, uh, for Rick, my name is Tyler. Uh, we wish you good night and take care. Stay safe. Good night, everybody. Thank you.